everybody, welcome back to another video, and today we are going to be doing something quite a bit different from the usual sort of video that I do, but this is something that I've had in my mind that I've wanted to do on this channel for a very long time. That is to just kind of dive into some historical topics that I'm interested in, and specifically, I wanted to talk about one of, if not my favorite, historical figure, definitely my favorite historical figure from antiquity, and that is Alexander the Great. This is part one of my presentation I'll be doing on Alexander the Great, and this is going to be um, his early life leading up to just before him attacking the Persian Empire. I'm not sure when I'll do part two, but definitely within the next couple months I'd like to get part two out, if maybe not a little bit sooner. So, today, Alexander the Great, he was born in 356 BCE, and he died in 323 BCE. There's a portrait of him there on the right. I'm going to start with his early life. Alexander was born in Bella the capital of the Kingdom of Macedon, which is today in modern-day Greece. There's a little bit of controversy around all this because North Macedonia is a separate country from Greece, and North Macedonia uh, claims a lot of the heritage of ancient Macedon. They have a large multi-story statue of Alexander the Great. It's actually a, a magnificent, glorious statue. I'd love to go see it someday. But, you know, there's a little bit of con contention about who owns this history and who doesn't. Geographically, it's Greek. But, as we know, history and culture isn't always geographical, sometimes culture travels, right? And, um, Greece actually used the debate over Alexander's legacy and Macedonia's legacy and the statue of Alexander in North Macedonia as part of their attempt to block North Macedonia from gaining NATO membership. Um, but Anyways, Alexander was born to Philip II, who was the king of Macedon. And as a child, he was raised by a woman named Lenike, who was the sister of Alexander's future general, Galatus the Black, who saved Alexander's life at the Battle of Granicus, but was later killed by Alexander, that being Galatus the Black was killed, not Lenike. Also apologies if I get any of these pronunciations wrong, I'm not great with Greek type pronunciations, um, you know, so if I get anything wrong, any of my viewers who know the pronunciations better, just let me know, and I'll try to, um, have those things better in part two. And here we have a map um, from about 345 BCE. Um, so this is a little bit after he was born. It's not completely accurate to the period he was born, but as you can see, that little white arrow there pointing to Bella in the kingdom of Macedon, you can see where Alex 
Alexander was born. If you just want to look at that white arrow there. And there are some legends surrounding his birth, some myth around his birth. Olympias, his mother, dreamed that her womb was struck by a thunderbolt that caused a flame to spread far and wide in her words. And that's not the only dream about her womb. Philip dreamed that he sealed Olympias' womb with a seal engraved with the image of a lion. And there's some discourse as to whether or not she was pregnant before she married Philip to another man. There's some discourse around the time that this was some sort of divine contraception, right? Similar to what we see with Jesus Christ and, you know, 300 years later. Um, but Plutarch, Plutarch was a biographer of this age who is the primary source of most of the information we'll be speaking about today. He offered an interpretation of these visions that Alexander was the son of the god Zeus and that Alexander was, you know, born through divine contraception, um, divine I don't know that I don't know the exact word, but he was of divine parentage because he was not really the son of Philip. Alexander was the son of Zeus. And you see Alexander associated with a lot with lion imagery um, in statues and paintings and such. He's, he has you know a lion's head on his helmet or, or things like that. Um, and that goes back to Philip's uh, dream. Uh, As more about his early life, Alexander broke a horse that his father was unable to, which he named Bucephalus. Bucephalus eventually took him all the way to India on his conquest before dying of old age. And at the age of 13, Alexander began a tutelage under Aristotle. Aristotle, one of the most famous philosophers of all time, an extremely intelligent and wise man who we still study today in 2023. In exchange for Aristotle mentoring his son, King Philip uh, agreed to rebuild Aristotle's hometown, and he freed all of the slaves that he had captured from Aristotle's hometown. Also, guys, just at this point, you know, I just want to say I'm not a historian, I'm not an expert. This is just stuff that interests me. If I'm getting this information wrong, just let me know. Um, you know, I approach history kind of like from a hobbyist perspective. Again, not an expert. Uh, Regency. Having finished his education, at age 16, Alexander was left in charge as Philip II was waging a war against the Thracians. Thrace was a nation uh, to the north uh, of Macedon, the kingdom of Macedon. They were sort of a tribal people. So the Thracians are talked about. You'll see me reference them kind of as a monolithic group, but in reality, from what I understand, Thrace was sort of a group of different tribal groups, different tribes. In his father's absence, Alexander dealt with the revolt of the mighty tribe. Again, that's a, it's a Thracian tribe. Colonizing their territory and erecting the first of many cities to be named after him, Alexandropolis. And as we're going to see in part two, not this part, Alexandria is all over the place. I mean, there's an Alexandria in Egypt. If you want to know why, is there a place in Egypt named after Alexander the Great? Well, we'll get there, but I'm sure you can guess. Uh, Philip's return. After his return, Philip sent Alexander to subdue revolts in southern Thrace. 
and then on to a campaign against the city of Perinthus. During this campaign, Alexander reportedly saved his father's life. And you see here, I have an arrow pointing to the city of Perinthus. If you can't see it, it's in the top right of the screen. If you look at me, see Thrace, top right of the screen, Perinthus, right there, right on the edge of Thrace, almost a Persian Empire. Uh, campaign in southern Greece is what we could do next in his life. Alexander was joined by King Philip and marched into Thermopylae, then through to Eladia. The Athenians formed an alliance with Thebes against the invaders as Philip and Alexander conquered Amphissa, then rejected Philip's offer of peace he extended to them upon his return to Eladia. So here's the map. You see we have three arrows here. So they were in Pella, they went down south through Thessaly into Thermopylae. Then from Thermopylae they went to Aladia. Once they got to Aladia, Thebes and Athens, you can see are a little bit southeast of Aladia, but I don't have them marked, Thebes and Athens. They decided to form an alliance because they thought that the Macedonians were coming to them next. Alexander and Philip ex instead go west to Amphissa. They conquer Amphissa. They head back to Eladia. They head back east later. And when they get there, they see that the Athenians and the Thebians are there in alliance against them. And they offered them a peace deal but they are declined. They do not want peace. And now we get to the Battle of Chironia, or Chironia, by Chironia. As Alexander and Philip marched south, they were met by the combined forces of Thebes and Athens near the village of Chironia. During the battle, Philip commanded the right flank of the army and Alexander commanded the left. The two sides fought a long and brutal battle before Philip feigned a retreat. This lured the undested Athenian troops out of their formation because they gave chase. They broke formation of the Thebians to chase away Philip, thinking that they had routed Philip's troops. But them breaking formation allows Alexander to break the Thebian lines. With the cohesion of their enemies lost, Philip turned his troops back around, completely rooting the Athenians. And then now, with his troops on the right and Alexander's troops on the left, they have the Thebians completely surrounded and the Thebians stood no chance, they were just wiped out. And here's just a little diagram of the battle. You see there on the left, you have Alexander and the Thessalians, and you have their phalanx. The phalanx were these groupings of spear-wielding uh, soldiers. They had really long spears, which was this military invention of Macedon um, that completely like changed the way that wars were fought at this time period. And then on the right there you see that you have Philip and the Macedonian horses. And as you can see you have that feigned retreat there um, indicated by their movement. The aftermath of the battle um, historians consider this one of the most decisive battles in ancient history. As with no armies to halt, to halt Philip's advances, the war was effectively over because uh, outside of Sparta, who really weren't involved in this conflict and were more, you know, off to their own um, down further south, uh, Thebes and Athens were the largest forces in this region. So really with them both
both wiped out. There really wasn't anybody to put up any true resistance. More than a thousand Athenians died, 2,000 were taken prisoners. And the really interesting thing here is that the 300 members of the sacred band of the Thebans, who at the time were considered the most elite fighting force to the point where people considered them invincible, like people thought they might be immortal, they were all killed. And there was actually a, a statue, a monument of a, of a great lion that was built near where the battle took place. And for you know years and years, historians and um, you know people thought that it could be a monument or a grave rather to the sacred band of the Thebans. They, they thought that might be where those 300 soldiers were buried. And then a few years ago, they ended up excavating the site. They dug you know under and around the the lion so you know as to not disturb the monument and they actually found about 200 and I think it was like 250 240 bodies under there so it seems that that theory is correct and that is where the sacred band is buried is under that lion I think it's called the lion of Sharonia I believe that's what it's called uh, more aftermath Alexander and Philip marched unopposed into Peloponnese and then into Corinth where they established the Hellenic League, uh, which included most Greek city-states, say in Sparta. You guys might have heard of the Hellenic League before. Basically, it was the entire region of all the city-states, the major powers, united under the basic basically the one goal to defeat the Persian Empire. But Sparta said they didn't want to have anything to do with it. Sparta was, they wanted to be independent from the League. And Sparta was like on its own island, so they were pretty hard to deal with. And for the most part, both Philip and Alexander just left Sparta alone. Um, they were kind of just isolationists. Philip was made hegemon of the Hellenic League and announced his plans to wage war against the Persian Empire. And at this time, you know, 350 BCE, the Persian Empire is the largest empire the world has ever seen, and they were really like the first big world superpower. Ton of money, huge military, lots of resources, cities, everything. But they were starting to decline. They were a superpower in decline. And Philip recognized that they had to become vulnerable. You know, they were, they were no longer this invincible superpower. There were some cracks starting to form. And he wanted to see just how big those cracks were. Now we get to Alexander's exile. Um, this is a very interesting chapter in his life. I've always found this part of his history really weird, and I think this is one of those disconnects from modern society and the society of antiquity. But Upon their return to Bella, Philip fell in love with a woman named Cleopatra Eurydice, the daughter of his general Attalus, and married her. This made Alexander's position as heir less secure, as he was only half Macedonian, and any children of the new couple would be fully Macedonian children. And this is a painting um, that I found supposedly of Cleopatra Eurydice, um, what she looked like. Um, but again, this is not, I don't believe, rather, this is a contemporary painting. This would have been made hundreds of years later, so who's to say how accurate this is? And then here's a quote from Plutarch. At the wedding of Cleopatra, whom Philip fell in love with and married, she being much too young for him, her uncle, Adalus, in his drink, desired the Macedonians would implore the gods 
to give them a lawful successor to the kingdom by his niece. This so irritated Alexander that throwing one of the cups at his head, You villain, said he, what am I then a bastard? Then Philip, taking Adalus's part, rose up and would have run his son through, but by good fortune for them both, either his over-hasty rage or the wine he had drunk made his foot slip so that he fell down on the floor, at which Alexander reproachfully insulted over him. See there, said he, the man who makes preparations to pass out of Europe into Asia, overturned in passing from one seat to another. And that's a quote from Blue Dark. Few things we can glean from this, uh, Cleopatra, way too young for Philip, perhaps even underage, almost definitely underage, definitely under 18. But, you know, in those days, that wasn't as taboo as it is, to, as it is today. So for Blue Dark to even remark on that means she would have been much younger than even by the standards of that day, which is shocking. And then, you know, her uncle Adalus, Philip's general, is basically saying, let's all pray that they have a child because he doesn't think Alexander is good enough to be king. And then Philip, once Alexander, you know, speaks out against Adalus, was literally going to kill his son his son who he had just fought a war with by his side. He was going to kill his son uh, in, I don't know, uh, to, to protect the honor of his general. This whole, this whole situation here is just, like I said, this is one of the bits that I think, you know, our modern cultural framing kind of robs us of this. And like, it, it just seems very alien to me, but and this is, this is one of those things uh, that is his exile and his return. After all that happened, Alexander, he fled Macedon with his mother. Uh, he went to Illyria after leaving her with her father in Dodona. And they had just gone through and conquered Illyria. They had, you know, marched their army through Illyria. But interestingly enough, if you, if you look at the records of the time, Alexander was greeted as a friend and not as an enemy or a conqueror. They loved him in Illyria. Um, six months after he left, Alexander was convinced to return to Bella by Demeritus, who was a family friend of them. And he and Philip seemingly mended their relationship because there's no further mention of tension between them. And I guess he kind of just went home and act like nothing ever happened. Now we get Alexander's ascension to the throne. While at his daughter's wedding, Philip was assassinated by Pausanias, his bodyguard. And Pausanias wasn't just Philip's bodyguard, he was like the captain of the bodyguards. He was like the head bodyguard, and he killed Philip. While attempting to flee, Pausanias tripped over a vine and was killed by two of Alexander's companions, Perdiccas and Leonidas. Alexander was immediately proclaimed king by the nobility and the army. He was only 20 years old. And on the right there, that is a, obviously a drawing, or, and not obviously of the period. This is, you know, a much more modern drawing uh, depicting the assassination of King Philip II of Macedon. And now, after he becomes king, Alexander starts consolidating power. Alexander began his reign by eliminating any potential rivals to the throne. He executed his cousin, Amyntas IV, as well as two Macedonian princes, and Adalus. Philip's general, who had openly prayed for a proper heir. So Alexander's like, you know what? I can hold a grudge. Remember when you had that whole big thing and you were praying that 
my father would give birth to someone who could replace me. You're going to be executed. How about that? And Alexander's mother ordered that Cleopatra, Eurydice, and her daughter from Philip Europa be burned alive. So Olympias, she was like, oh, you're going to replace me with a newer model. Because remember, Cleopatra, Eurydice, probably, I don't know, I'm not going to guess it right. I don't actually know. Um, maybe 13 at this time when she died. Let me see if there's any, um, let me see if there's any record of her death. Um, I don't know if we know when she was born. So we don't know when he was when she was born. No. Yeah, we actually have no idea. That's interesting. There's, there's no one even attempts to say how old she was, but if it was remarked by someone of the age that she was young, she would have been very young, definitely a child, perhaps prepubescent. Well, actually, no, she couldn't have been prepubescent because she gave a daughter, Europa, but they were both burned alive by Alexander's mother. But after Philip died, there were revolts. Philip was named Hegemon. He had just consolidated power of his own after marching south, Athens, Thebes, all these things. He had formed the Hellenic League, but hearing of Philip's death, Thebes, Athens, Thessaly, and the Thracian tribes went into revolt. Now Thessaly, they were seemingly friendly enough with Macedonia. I think they shared troops with them and things like that, but they went into revolt. Alexander was advised to handle the situation diplomatically, but instead he mustered an army of 3,000 men and rode south. Encountering the Thessalians in the mountains, they surrendered to Alexander, adding their numbers to his ranks. Arriving in Corinth, the Athenians asked for peace, and Alexander pardoned their rebellion before Oh, pardon their rebellion before, like his father before him. He was appointed hegemon of the Hellenic League. So he didn't even end up having to fight the Athenians. He just rode up with like, you know, 3,000 plus men, maybe like you now 3,200 or something, 4,000 maybe. And uh, Athens was just like, you know what? Never mind. We don't want to fight you. And Alexander pardoned them. He, one thing you'll see with them is... He tried to be fairly lenient with things. Like, he did not punish them for revolting. He just straight up pardoned them. He, he seemingly tries to be lenient sometimes, even though he does also become quite violent. And then while in Corinth, uh, doing this peace deal with the Athenians, a very famous historical meeting between Alexander and the philosopher Diogenes takes place, and Diogenes is kind of credited as being the creator of uh, cynicism, that school of thought, but a great philosopher, and you have a depiction here on the right of this meeting between Alexander and Diogenes, and we have another quote from Plutarch. Thereupon, many statesmen and philosophers came to Alexander with their congratulations, and he expected that Diogenes of Sinope, also, who was daring in Corinth, would do likewise. But since that philosopher took not the slightest notice of Alexander, and continued to enjoy his leisure in the suburb of Cranion, Alexander went in person to see him, and he found him lying in the sun. Diogenes raised himself up a little when he saw so many people coming towards him, and fixed his eyes upon Alexander. And when that monarch addressed him with greetings, and asked if he wanted anything, Yes, said Diogenes, stand a little out of my son. It is said that Alexander was so struck by this, and admired so much the haughtiness and grandeur of the man who had nothing but scorn for him 
that he said to his followers, who were laughing and jesting about the philosophers, they went away. But truly, if I were not Alexander, I wish I were Diogenes. I think that that's, you know, there's a very famous quote, there's a very famous meeting between these two. Um, you know, Alexander and all of his glory, the new king, conqueror, all these things. And you have this man, Diogenes, who really kind of lived like a street urchin. Doesn't care at all. All he cares about is not having his son blocked. And there is something admirable about that. And um, yeah, I'm sure that you, if you don't know much about Alexander or Diogenes and his philosophies, you've probably heard at least a little bit about this encounter. Into the Balkans, with only the Thracians remaining in revolt, Alexander moved to secure his northern borders. Starting at Amphipolis, the Macedonian army marched into Tripoli, defeating the Thracians at Mount Hamas along the way. The army of Tripoli was defeated at the Leginus River. Alexander marched for three days to the Danube River, which is the second longest river in all of Europe. Thracian forces camped on the opposite shore, and Alexander crossed the river as they slept, ambushing them in the night. Alexander defeated Cletus of Illyria and King Glaucius of the Delondi in turn, forcing them to flee with their troops and finally securing his northern borders. So. He's up in, you know, what is now the Balkan countries, that area. Taking care of all of this. But then while he's up north fighting the Thracians, Thebes, and Athens revolt again. And you have to remember, Athens gave up without a fight. But then Alexander leaves, and they're kind of looking around, and they're like, Wait, what did we agree to? While Alexander was dealing with the Thracians in the north, the Thebans and Athenians again rebelled against his rule. And Alexander, he knew he had to work, he had to move quickly, because he couldn't let them establish allies. He couldn't let them, you know, raise troops and that stuff. He had to move fast. And he marched over 300 miles in a fortnight, two weeks. He got to Thebes so quickly that they were in disbelief that it was Alexander who had appeared, thinking that it must be one of his generals. Like, as he was coming up, they literally did not believe the reports that he was approaching. He basically approached completely. You know, nobody checked him. And nobody did anything. Cause they were like, there's no way. He's, he's up in Thrace. Well, no, he was there. And there's Thebes. And now I don't have it marked, but you heard that he was in Philippi. And if you can see, if you look up at the Thrace section up north, you can see where Philippi is. And you can see down there's Thebes, where I've marked with the white arrow. And he went that entire distance in two weeks. And remember, this isn't, you know, back then he had horses, but he also had 3,000 men. So he's moving at a marching pace, you know. You have to move that many people, plus the logistics that come with that many people. You're feeding them. They have weapons they have to maintain. They have to, you know, use the restroom. You know, you're, you have camping. They have, you know, they're, they're hauling all this equipment for housing and tents and stuff. The fact that he made that trek in two weeks is outstanding. And now we have the Battle of Thebes. Upon his arrival, all of Thebes, save for Athens, who provided weapons. Oh, I missed a word here. Upon his arrival, all of Thebes' is allies. So Thebes had made some little allies in the area. All of Thebes' is allies, except for Athens, who provided weapons, but they refused to send soldiers. They refused to send any Athenian soldiers. They deserted Thebes to handle Alexander alone. So they were talking all this big dog. They were like, oh yeah, we'll back you up. We'll help you out. We'll, you know, give you weapons. We'll give you whatever you want. Let's take down Alexander. We got this. Then Alexander shows up. 
and they're like, uh, you know what, actually, I think you guys can handle this one on your own. Alexander, not wanting to destroy Thebes, camped his troops near their walls, hoping to coerce them into surrender, even offering them lenient terms. He was just like, just sit there and look at my 3,000 soldiers, realize you can't beat us, and just give up, but they wouldn't give up, and apparently he, like, he was offering them, like, I'll let everybody live except for the leaders of the revolt, so it was only like three or four people he wanted to execute, the political leaders, and they wouldn't accept the terms. So after three days, Alexander finally attacked the city of Thebes, and after finding a gate that had been abandoned by the Theban guard, his troops penetrated the walls of the city. I'm not sure why or how that gate was abandoned, but, uh, you know, maybe they they retreated. They didn't want to get killed in the conflict, so they just ran entirely, but unattended gate. Oops, now we're inside your city. But, um, unfortunately for Thebes, you know, Alexander knew that to stop future revolts like this, especially while he was away in Persia, you know, doing his conquest, you know, his kingdom needs to be stable and secure in his absence. And he'd spent all his time consolidating his power. They'd already revolted once before. He couldn't handle anything like this happening again. He knew he had to make an example of Thebes. So he executed all males and enslaved every woman and child before burning Thebes to the ground. The only things that were left unburned were the temples, the citadel, and funnily enough, this one always makes me laugh, there was a poet named Pindar, and Alexander was a particular fan of his poems. Pindar is considered one of the great poets of antiquity, and some people even call him the greatest poet of antiquity. Um, Alexander really enjoyed his poetry, so apparently there's some merit to that opinion. And because he liked his poetry so much, Alexander did not burn his house to the ground. So I'm gonna come in, I'm gonna kill every single man in this city. Every single woman and child is now a slave, and everything here is burned to the ground except the religious buildings and the castle, okay? And that guy's house, because I like the words he writes. I've always thought that's very, very funny. And that is the end of part one. Like I said, this is mainly the early life of Alexander. This is before his conquest east into Persia, the part that he is most famous for. But that we're going to get to in part two. We're already at 40 minutes, just in part one. Part two will probably go for over an hour, but I really do hope you guys like this. This is something really special to me. I've wanted to do this for a long time. And, uh, yeah, man, I hope you dig it. Uh, part two, like I said, I'm not sure how long it's going to take, but I'll get it out at some point. If you did like it, I really would appreciate on this video, especially if you'd leave a thumbs up and subscribe to the channel for more content just like this almost every single day. Until next time, guys. Bye-bye.